and welcome back to the fourth of four episodes on the Gospel Topics essays that have to do with polygamy. There's four total essays on polygamy. And if you include the kind of the introduction one, so we're on four of four. And before we get to the topic, of course, we want to introduce all three of us who are here to lend our voices to the cause of look going through these, these essays and talking about what they are saying and what they are not saying. So I'd love to uh, first introduce uh, Lindsay Hanson Park, who is kind enough to join us once again. And Lindsay, say hello to the fine folks at home. Thanks for having me back. I love talking about this topic. So big surprise that I'm here again. <laughs> and Lindsay, I, one thing I'd love to be able to do is, can you tell everybody kind of what what are you doing right now in this space? Not necessarily polygamy space, but but what are you working on that you're excited about that you'd like to tell everybody about? Well, I um, in the, am the executive director of Sunstone. So Sunstone is my primary focus. And right now, because of COVID, we're not doing our in-person meetings. So we're doing like movie nights, usually the second and fourth Thursday, where we watch a Mormon movie on Facebook together. And then we just talk about it, which is so wild and crazy and fun. But yeah, I'm doing a lot of stuff. I'm working on a biography of Juanita Brooks for Signature Books. Yes. And my first draft is done. Got a long road ahead. That's been great. And um, since some Mormon history podcast that we're doing with Brian and I, we just went to the archives at BYU yesterday and it was so fun. Saw those yeah. pictures. That looked awesome. Oh my gosh. I can't wait to tell you what we found. I, I told Brian to keep it quiet for a little while, but we found <laughs> something we, that we were going to find and we found it. Um, and I'm also working on some cool things out, a little outside of the Mormon community that I'll be able to talk about soon, but I'm helping get Mormon stories, uh, get Mormon history out in a larger way into the larger world on some projects. So I'm really excited about that too. Very cool. Thank you. Always busy and always doing really cool stuff. What, yeah. So I'd love to ask, what's the best way right now that someone could support, support Sunstone? Honestly, um, we are completely run on donations. So if you want to become, you know, a monthly subscriber or just give us a lump sum, but really what you can do is attend our summer conference. That's like our big Mormon comic con where people of all different kinds of Mormonism come together. So we have, you know, fundamentalists, we have LDS, we have ex LDS, we have church historians, we have, you know, anti Mormons, all of them come together. And it's one of the few spaces that I know about where people can do that and uh, do it kindly and thoughtfully. We really try to promote thoughtful engagement. So it's cool. You can talk about any, we invite people to talk about Mormonism a little bit more dispassionately, step back from it and try to look at it from other people's perspectives. And so, yeah, you can come to our summer symposium and familiarize yourself with our Sense of Mormon History podcast. Brian Buchanan um, at Benchmark Books is the biggest Mormon nerd and in the best way. And he knows everything that there is to know. And so, yeah, th those are just a few ways you can help support us. Love it. And for donations, sunstone.org is, yeah, is where they go. You. Yeah. I really right. appreciate that. Awesome. That's great. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to go again. If it's digital or in person, I don't care. I'll be there. Uh, Anthony Miller is joining us as well. How are you, Anthony? I am doing great. It's good to be with you from cold and freezing Billings, Montana. What is week. the temperature today? Oh, I'm this weekend. It'll be sig single digits. So that's plenty cold. Below uh, 10. Plenty cold. Yeah. Yeah. Plenty. Although it was 57 degrees and sunny a couple of days ago. So that wasn't too bad. <laughs> If you are wondering, if you've heard this voice before, Anthony Miller, on previous episodes, of course, here with the Gospel Topics Essays Project, but you've heard him on Mormon Stories, you've probably read. Here's the, Anthony, I've got a bone to pick with you, actually. Whenever I, I it doesn't matter what LDS group I'm in on Facebook, uh, but when I see a, a question from somebody, an original post from somebody, it's 10 minutes old, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to post a thoughtful reply. It's too late. Anthony Miller with 155% of what I was going to say has already said it more eloquently than I could. Anthony, that's my teasing way of, of saying that your voice is awesome in this space. And I've learned a ton from you. I remember meeting you at Sunstone. Lindsay, this is where how we met was at Sunstone. <laughs> So that's Anthony, so great. We're bringing everyone together. I love there it. you go. That's, that's exactly that's right. right. Yeah. Anthony, well, what are you working on now? Well, fortunately, this time of the year is a little bit slower for my financial planning business. Most of my clients are retired and I meet with them all in the fourth quarter of the year. So this time of the year gives me an opportunity to 
post before you do on Facebook and uh, work on things like uh, we're doing here. So I have a few things going. Uh, people that have been paying attention in the community, I did a Mormon stories discussion about apologetics in December. Um, I uh, did another episode uh, with Britt Hartley and Jana Spangler on uh, Mormon stories about navigating uh, Christmas time as a newly deconstructed uh, member. Um, and uh, just this week, uh, we did a follow-up, uh, well, another episode where we did a panel discussion of the Givens new book, All Things New on Mormon Stories. Um, right now, uh, some of the things that I'm doing is um, the listeners might remember from previous episodes that I created and co-lead a local Mormon spectrum group here in Billings, Montana, and that really enriches my life. And and we continue to grow and support people uh, in their journeys here. Um, I have a blog, unpackingambiguity.com, that I need to share this and a few other episodes too uh, uh, from, from podcasts and so forth. Um, I'm going to do a, a TEDx talk in May about thriving and building community after a Mormon faith crisis, and I'm really excited about that. Um, I hired a writing uh, coach and mentor who's helping me. Some of my favorite uh, books in this space outside the Mormon community include Amber Scora's Leaving the Witness and Megan Phelps Roper's uh, uh, memoir about leaving the Westboro Baptist Church and so forth. And so I'm working on doing something like that myself uh, with regard to, uh, for a larger audience as well. Um, and so that's uh, different than writing essays and different than writing things like Facebook replies. So it's, <laughs> it's been a challenge, but I'm super excited about it. So I'm working on that too. Um, and I'm excited to have this discussion today about uh, the manifesto and the end of plural marriage as well. I just know that Anthony, you and Lindsay both edited down what you're doing significantly, and I'm still overwhelmed by how much you guys contribute. Uh, it's fantastic. It's so great. Uh, I'm Alan Mount. I, I tend to play the part of narrator on this. I'll be reading the essay tonight. Um, outside of, of this project, you may or may not recognize my voice from the Marriage in a Tightrope podcast, which I run with my wife, uh, Katie Mount. Uh, she's a peach and a plum and all of the sweetest of fruits. But we are uh, in a mixed faith marriage, and that's what that podcast is dedicated to, is mixed, mixed faith marriage, uh, which, Anthony, you are also in a mixed faith marriage, and that's how we've kind of bonded over the years. Exactly right. That's right. Uh, we just. Uh, Are you going to talk about your TikTok? You're kind of big deal on TikTok. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll talk about TikTok. You uh, should follow him on TikTok, everyone. He's great. Oh my goodness, you're so kind, and I was so excited to see you join too, Lindsay, and start sharing things. It's so great because you share all these factoids that people are like, "What?" <laughs> and they're so fun. Yeah, I like to freak people out. It's my birthright. <laughs> um, yeah, TikTok's a fun thing. I decided. You know what? This is one of the things that goes along with mixed faith marriage. Sometimes you have to let your post Mormon fly when you're in the mixed faith space. And this podcast is one of the ways I do that. And then I was like, about a month ago, I'm going to create a TikTok. And a, a few of my most recent ones, I mean, as far as ex Mormon ones go, a few thousand views. And it's like, oh, cool. People actually are watching this. Great. Great. So you're new on it too. We're both doing this together. Yeah. I, I mean, we're both a bunch of old people. With we're old, we're first. old folks. And I get, I get people making fun of my bald hairline and, and I lean into it. Like I mentioned well, people that. People are mean on there. Someone told me I needed conditioner, just like a flyby. I was like, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Lindsay, you've you've gotten so much worse than a conditioner <laughs> comment. I think you're going to be just fine on TikTok. Okay, good, good. Awesome. Now, okay, the rapport is built. We're ready to dive into, now that we're having a good time, let's talk about the end of, of uh, plural marriage and the manifesto. Um which just in the title, a little bit of a misnomer, the manifesto and the end of plural marriage, uh, the manifestos that should be plural. I'm correct? just so glad it ended. I'm so glad it's over. Yay. We did it. <laughs> we did it. There's but no is, remnants. Is there it are really no ghosts. over? <laughs> there are no ghosts of polygamy, right? Uh, I it think ended you're being a long sarcastic. Time yeah. We don't do that anymore, Anthony. We'll get uh, there. We'll yeah, get we'll there. get there. We'll talk about it. <laughs> All right, so I will I will jump in and read uh, this this introductory paragraph. And as as you know, we usually don't get very far. So Lindsay and and Anthony, as as I'm going, even in the middle of the paragraph, if you want me to stop, you can just raise your hand since we're sharing video, even though we don't post the video. And I'll shut up and call on you, and we can go from there. Okay, the manifesto and the end of plural marriage. 
For much of the 19th century, a significant number of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints practiced plural marriage, the marriage of one man to more than one woman. The beginning and end of the practice were directed by revelation through God's prophets. The initial command to practice plural marriage came through Joseph Smith, the founding prophet and president of the church. In 1890, President Wilford Woodruff issued the manifesto, which led to the end of plural marriage in the church. Well, there we go. There's the first the first paragraph. Uh, Anthony, let me let me ask you. Let me just tee you up a little bit here. So that last sentence, uh, even if you have a elementary understanding of the timeline of of the end of, of polygamy on this topic. That last sentence is a little bit misleading and apparently to my dog, a little bit upsetting. There he goes. So Anthony, can you can you talk a little bit about why that sentence could be problematic and the language that is used there? Yeah, so I, I rem- you know, I my parents joined the church when I was three. I, I grew up in the church, didn't have a faith crisis until I ran into the gospel topics essays when I was 49, nearly five years ago now. And um I had always been led to believe that the 1890 manifesto was a revelation and that after it, not only new plural ceilings ended, but actually living in plural marriage ended. And and whenever I would get curious and ask questions about it, either everyone had the same understanding that I did, that there was an 1890 manifesto and nobody lived it again, or they would get really quiet and not want to say anything about it because they knew that plural marriage didn't end with the 1890 manifesto. Not not only the new ceilings didn't end, but living in plural marriage openly as members of the church didn't end in 1890. Right. <clears throat> so there was another manifesto, right? Wasn't there, wasn't there, there was a second one? Was there a third one? There's three. There's three. But Lindsay. there's two that were from our guys. From yeah. our guys. So what is the third one? The and third I one, know that this will likely come up in the, the timeline, but official and we can get to that, but I don't want to like spoil the, the ending. Right. <laughs> we usually like we're we're getting started and then we have all these things in our head and let's just say it regardless of whether it's time or Cliffhanger. not. Cliffhanger. No, Cliffhanger thank you for the listener. You gotta stay listening. That's right. That's right. All right. I'll um I'll keep going. The end of plural marriage required great faith and sometimes complicated, painful and intensely personal decisions on the part of individual members and church leaders. Like the beginning of plural marriage in the church, the end of the practice was a process rather than a single event. Revelation came line upon line, precept upon precept. And before we get to that, I have a comment on that last sentence, but Lindsay, one thing that I love about your work on on polygamy is the focusing on the individuals. Because I look at this and, and... Really, if if the church is going up and we're going to learn why they were up against so much pressure uh, and against whom, um, those individuals and those families were were put in a really tough spot. I mean, you literally have to rip families apart in order to, to comply with the, the end of this. Can you talk a little bit about like sympathetically with with the individuals that were practicing it and what the end of of the practice of polygamy meant for many of the people. I know many different people, some people didn't end it. <laughs> well, and that's why I laugh at the word end because it really, it's not going to end. I I think as long as Mormonism is around, it won't end. It still permeates our doctrine. I think even if the LDS church officially abandons the, like, uh, the, the theology surrounding it, it would be nearly impossible because uh, frontier Mormonism, Brigham Young and John Taylor uh, and a few guys after him made sure that polygamy was infused in everywhere. It shows up everywhere. And I always say, I sound like a, you know, crazy, like conspiracy theorist, like polygamy is everywhere, but it is. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so to end something like that is, is impossible. And in fact, with the 1890 manifestos, we're going to talk about when the church issued that it didn't end it, not even for the man who issued it, Wilford Woodruff. He didn't stop marrying plural wives, neither did his apostles. And it starts really this really messy battleground. But you're right. What what happened was the the manifesto was a political move. There's absolutely no way to um, argue otherwise, unless you want to say that the church is swayed by politics and revelation comes through politics, which is fine. That's a faithful interpretation. But I just gave a presentation for the governor's uh, celebration of statehood for Utah and the Thrive 125. And so I'm 
I had to refresh my memory with all the ins and outs of this, of this history. And there's just no way around it. It was absolutely a result of the church's effort to try to get statehood, to uh, reincorporate themselves as citizens because the federal government was holding their citizenship. They disenfranchised Mormons and Mormon women. And so it was a political move. And I think what happened was all the families that had been sacrificing and living this for years were sort of the collateral to that. And they, and I, in so many ways, they still are today. And we can talk about that more. Thank you. That last sentence there, everything that you just explained, the last sentence kind of contradicts in a way. Maybe I can tie that together. So the last thing I read was revelation came line upon line, precept upon precept in quotes. That's a scripture. And you know, that's when, when you know, the best example, what you just gave is the person, the prophet, the president that actually issued that first manifesto didn't follow it. And would it be fair to say he didn't really have plans to follow it? I mean, that one, that one, we don't know because a lot of his, well, his journals have just been published. They have been restricted uh, by the church for years, but signature books published them. But the problem with that is it's a huge volume and it's like $895. But uh, so I haven't even read them yet. I've only read like excerpts, you know, that were snuck out when they were restricted and things like that. But uh, yeah, I think Woodruff was very torn as were all of the other apostles and colleagues at the time, because they had sacrificed for this. They had taught um, a lot of people to to do this and they had performed the marriages themselves. So they were really in a bad spot. I think that they had hoped that the manifesto would make it go away and then the government would go to their thing and they could still go on business as usual. But that's why we have a second manifesto because the first one didn't quite do the trick, not even to the leaders. Right, right. All right, so let's keep going. Um, Anti-polygamy laws and civil disobedience. For half a century, beginning in the early 1840s, church members viewed plural marriage as a commandment from God, an imperative that helped raise up a righteous posterity unto the Lord. Uh, Anthony, why don't you uh, talk about that? I'm going to go tell my children to stop yelling in the background. Okay, so I I think it's interesting that they say beginning in the 1840s, um, because I understand that Fanny Alger happened in the 1830s, maybe 1833, plus or minus, maybe. And Lucinda Pendleton Morgan Harris is supposedly a plural wife in 1838. So um, my, I guess my question is, why would they say beginning, what was the purpose of saying in the early 1840s when there's evidence of two plural marriages prior to that? I think for, can I uh, speak to this? So I know some of the historians that were involved in, in the essays, and I will say that I do think that there are a lot of church historians that have integrity. I believe that I've seen it. Um, my work is not always popular with them, but they've been very generous about it. And so I, I think that there's this tension with this essays. There's this idea of getting these issues out, getting ahead of it, but also containment, right? Like we have to take these things and kind of contain them. And so we have good historians working on this, but they're working in a political space too. To be a Mormon historian is sort of a political act because the apostles don't want a narrative that's going to contradict the one that they've held on to for so long. And I don't think that there's a consensus on Fanny Alger being a plural wife. You know, the faithful narrative, and I think they talk about this in the saints even, uh, is that Fanny Alger was Joseph's first attempt at plural wives, you know, in, in the 1830s, like you said. But I just, I don't buy it. I don't think that there's enough historical evidence. I don't think it fits the pattern. I think Joseph Smith, um, had problems just like everyone else has problems. He was a man just like everyone else is. And I know a lot of people that if they were in his position would have probably abused the power, would have not put themselves in check for things like that. And I think given Joseph Smith's sexual history growing up, what we know about him, it makes sense that he would have probably just had an affair on his wife. But how do you say that in the essay? I mean, it's not popular. It's even people will give me, you know, trouble for saying it now, but I don't think Fanny Alger was the first plural wife, but that's a faithful narrative. But I think in good integrity, you can't really argue that because there's not a lot of evidence to support it. Yeah. So the only thing that I'd say, I really enjoyed Ben Park's Kingdom of Nauvoo. And one thing that took me off guard when I read it is he talked about polygamy starting there 
and uh, or plural plural marriage starting there. And and later in an interview uh, with him about his book, that was brought up, and his answer was that he didn't think that the relationships that happened before Nauvoo were the same thing. It was a different thing. Maybe alluding to what you're talking about is that it wasn't part of plural marriage. It was Joseph just had extra relationships potentially. I mean, you can't say that as a Mormon historian without taking flack in this community. And I know that because I've said it plenty, but the reality is if we're going to, I mean, you can argue that Joseph Smith was experimenting with plural doctrine as early as 1831 with the Lamanite revelation, which Joseph Smith, it's recorded secondhand by W.W. Phelps, where he said, where he claims that Joseph said that these men should uh, convert Lamanites and marry the women to help sort of colonize them, turn them whiter, blah, 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 blah. We don't really have any evidence of that happening. So it was never really put into practice, but You can argue, and I have argued that Joseph Smith was probably experimenting with these ideas, but I think uh, we work so hard to try to make sense of Fanny Alger. And I think that the reality is, is he probably, you know, lusted after. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. So I think Ben was probably trying to um, be careful of that. But at the same time, I mean, we really don't know what Joseph's intentions were. But I do find it hard to believe that Kirtland polygamy was happening. You know, I, I just don't, Missouri and Kirtland, they're the focus and the, I just, I think Joseph Smith was messing around on Emma. And I think that the stories back that up. Well, Oliver believed that. I just, when I read this part of the essay and then looked at Wikipedia, you know, with the list of Joseph Smith's wives, the first thing that stood out to me is there were two before the 1840s. And so, well, what, what jumped out to me is the second part of this sentence, that church members viewed plural marriage as a commandment of God beginning in the early 1840s. I mean, for the general, and correct me if I'm wrong, but for the, the general church membership didn't know it was going on in the early 1840s. For sure it, didn't. it wasn't pub. Yeah. It, it was very secretive. It wasn't publicly uh, announced uh, until 1852 Uh, when it was made official. And so like this, that's the problem that I have with this sentence here is it's, it's trying to paint this picture of, oh yeah, they viewed it as a commandment of God in the early 1840s, the church members, like, no, a very select few church leaders, perhaps, but no, I don't don't know. I don't, I think the church members are, well, and even that, you know, so like I said, I was at the archives yesterday and it was interesting because we were going through Richard Anderson's papers. He was a faithful church historian and BYU professor. And he uh, was trying to chronicle all the lists of Joseph Smith's wife. So he was, he was basically from what I could tell was pulling from Fawn Brody's list because she was the first one that actually like published a list and her research is really amazing. It's miraculous from what she was able to do. But what they did was and, and this is what people don't realize now, especially like our generation who we have our list, we have Todd Compton's list, you know, but at the time um, it was still kind of, I don't know, like not clear on who Joseph Smith married, not only because it was secretive, but he really only practiced it for like a solid four years. And, and it was chaos. Navu was chaos for Joseph. He had too many irons, too many fires. He got cl- too close to the sun. And so this idea of like even attributing Fanny Alger later on is really comes after the frontier period where you have folks like Brigham Young who, whenever there was a problem, a sexual problem in the community, polygamy was sort of the solution. And they still, this still happens in polygamous communities today. So like, for example, if you find out that a, that a man was molesting his 14 year old stepdaughter, well, to solve that problem, just seal him up. And then her virtue is not, you know, in compromise. So I think that there's this like attitude of like attributing wives later on that weren't there, but Anthony's right. um, Or I guess you're right, Alan, the community didn't even know. And the community, I would say even in Brigham Young's time weren't quite clear. There were some who knew and were prominent because they got sealed to other prophets like Brigham Young or Heber C. Kimball. But you have claims of women later on saying that Joseph Smith promised me this, Joseph Smith promised me that. And because there was no systematized way of doing it, because it was so secretive, it's really hard to know. Okay. You know, I look, sometimes every sentence needs to be analyzed. (laughs) This next sentence that we've already read, though not all church members were expected to enter into plural marriage, those who did so believed they would be blessed for their participation. What does believe they would be blessed mean? 
what were leaders teaching about the difference between celestial or plural marriage and monogamous marriage? I think um, they were taught that it was going to be this new, exciting doctor. So it's it's different. Navu period is different than the frontier period, and they build on each other. So that's important to know. But in Navu, it was really this idea of like, hey, there's this new, exciting revelation that the Lord has given. And, and I even think when Joseph Smith before DNC 132, before Emma gets involved, Joseph isn't really even introducing it that we know of as a revelation. It's sort of more an experimentation. And anyone that's been, I hate to say this, this might make people mad, but like in a post-Mormon community where polyamory gets thrown out, you can see how these things sort of manifest, right? People are like curious, they're, they're connected. But also I think that Someone in status of power, I always refer Navu secret polygamy to like the vow, Keith Ranieri on the vow, like you have a man in power and he doesn't have to do much to convince the women to be involved with that, right? And you're, you see Keith Ranieri and you're like, why that guy? Because someone with all this power and status who is very dynamic, um, he attracts people. He had men that swore fealty and loyalty to him for the rest of their lives. They would kill for the man. That is a man that can attract people. And so women were attracted to him too in that way, but it wasn't that easy. There are plenty of women that turned down these men in Navu, including Joseph Smith, because it was very coercive the way that they would present it. I mean, we have stories of women, Sarah Pratt, Martha Brotherton being locked in rooms, you know, like and introduced this idea and then sort of threatened. And so in order for Joseph Smith to do this, there were some women that signed up on it for it, no problem, but there are a lot of women that struggled. And if you read their accounts, this is consistent across the board, and it, it's still the consistent to a lot of polygamous women today. They said, I hated it. I was troubled by it. I had to pray. And then eventually a witness came. So the blessings that they were promised were to come later on in the next life. They knew signing up for it, that it would suck. That's inherent with polygamy. Sacrifice brings forth the blessings of heaven. That comes from the Mormon idea of you have to work your way into heaven and you have to do it by suffering. So if polygamy causes you to suffer, that's good news because the more you suffer on earth, the more you're going to build up in heaven. And to me, that's like such a common idea. I don't know if you guys feel that growing up Mormon. It's so common that you're not like, that's not messed up. That's Mormon. But if you're stepping back and you're looking, like apply that to Keith Ranieri, like, oh, sorry, women, you're gonna be with him. It's gonna hurt. But in the next life, you'd be like, that's so messed up. But that's how, that's how women were introduced to the principle. And across the board, most of them struggled with it, but they eventually came around because the eternal blessings that they believed in that they believed were coming for them uh, were sort of the thing that got them through. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's, that's where, that's where the, the problem with polygamy for me personally comes is that that coercion and the scary thing, like you said, Lindsay, is how easy it is for those at times it, it, that are already in positions of power to have that, that man, manipulation, that coercion. Uh, it's just such a power dynamic that just feels icky. Um, Anthony. Yeah. So three quick things. Number one, if uh, you sit down and you read DNC 132 all in one sitting, um, uh, and it's natural to interpret celestial and plural marriage to be synonymous because it starts out talking about plural or celestial marriage. And then it talks about a ma if a man takes a woman and then it ends up with plural marriage. And I think it's more of a recent phenomenon of uh, apologists or people in the church trying to say that it's bouncing back and forth between plural marriage and monogamous marriage, uh, because there is historical evidence that it was believed that celestial and plural marriage was synonymous. Um, one thing. Another thing is uh, there was a Anthony, can I just say one thing about that is we have folks like J. Rubin Clark to blame for that. So after the manifesto, we see a deliberate concerted PR effort to take the words of celestial marriage and reappropriate them to mean monogamous marriage. So that's why we have it now. But celestial marriage absolutely was code for polygamy at the time. There's no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. So I suggest that the listener sit down, read DNC 132, taking that into consideration. The second thing is uh, there was a, a lot of uh, maybe hubris is the wrong word. There were strong talks about the need to participate in plural marriage in order to get to the highest degree in the celestial kingdom. And uh, 
and that it was a right of people of men who had higher priesthood to have more wives and so forth. Um, so the the blessings were for you to participate and obtain the highest degree in the celestial kingdom. You need to do that. And then I'd suggest the listener. Uh, we won't take the time to sidetrack on this, but if you look up Mormon Reformation. Uh, it's a period of time between 1856 and 1857. Um, you'll be able to uh, read through that and get a better understanding of the role and significance of plural marriage during that period, which led to not all, only all the 30-year-olds uh, being taken as plural wives, but the 20-year-olds and then the teenagers and then down even into the preteens uh, because salvation was reliant on plural marriage, and they were running out of women. So I think those are three things that contribute to why so many people believed that plural marriage uh, was required to, to be blessed. All right, next paragraph. In many parts of the world, polygamy was socially acceptable and legally permissible. But in the United States, most people thought that the practice was morally wrong. These objections led to legislative efforts to end polygamy. Beginning in 1862, the U.S. government passed a series of laws designed to force Latter-day Saints to relinquish plural marriage. So, Anthony, in this one, could you talk a little bit about the legality of, of polygamy in all of the areas where it was sanctioned by the church and practiced by the church prior to the manifestos? So, in Illinois, there were anti-bigamy laws, and so it wasn't legal when it was practiced in Nauvoo. Um, uh, you know, they were in the wild, wild west, basically, when they were in Utah, but then there was the sub subsequent laws like this one in 1862. Uh, when they moved to Utah, was Utah was officially Mexican territory at the time. Yeah, but or only for a, like a period of two years. Yeah, short okay. period. Um, polygamy. And, and it was uh, illegal in Mexico, too, by the way. Yeah, polygamy was illegal in Mexico as well. Um but there was some sort of negotiation to reinterpret what the meaning of family was or something, but it was still illegal in Mexico. And then uh, by 1896, Canada made it explicitly illegal uh, uh, with the intent of passing that legislation to target the Mormons who had moved to Canada uh, by 1896. Yeah, we're jumping the timeline a little bit, but it fits in with the topic of legality because... Everywhere this was practiced, it it wasn't legal. It just on a federal level, beginning in 1862, the U.S. government started to to pass these series of laws. I want to say something about this idea that it was like legal everywhere else in a lot of other places in the world. That's so such an interesting statement. And I forgot that that was in there. So I'm, I'm glad you said that because the reality is, yeah, there were other cultural practices where they were, you know, in Islam and in, in some different, you know, tribes in different communities in the global South or whatever. But if you listen to what early church leaders were saying, Orson Pratt, Heber C. Kimball, uh, Brigham Young, Jedediah Grant, they were talking about other cultures of polygamy being bad and theirs was good. And it's so interesting because they would have seen all Mormon, early Mormons would have seen all of those other civilizations through a Victorian lens, racist, you know, um, through a colonizer lens. Here they come to these native communities, the, these indigenous communities and root out their sort of savage ways, right? That's how they saw it, that they were saving these people from these savage ways. So I don't think you get to have it both ways. You don't get to say like, oh, it's okay. Cause Mormons were just doing what they were doing in other places. No. It was, Victorian polygamy is not the, not the same for a lot of reasons. Yeah, that 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 sentence up there about polygamy was socially acceptable and legally permissible. It almost feels like the academic version of if your friend jumped off a cliff, would you? Uh, they're just, I mean, they're saying like, well, they're doing it. it. It feels very apologetic and kind of a five year old statement to me. Something my daughter would tell me when she's mad. Well, Zach was punching someone in the face, so I did it, too. All right, let's move on. From my children hitting each other. They literally put on boxing gloves today and my eight-year-old daughter beat up my seven-year-old son and I was so proud of her. Okay, moving on. <laughs> In the face of these measures, Latter-day Saints maintained that plural marriage was a religious principle protected under the U.S. Constitution. The church mounted a vigorous legal defense all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. In Reynolds versus United States, 1879, the Supreme Court ruled against the Latter-day Saints religious belief was protected by law, religious practice was not. According to the court's opinion, marriage was a civil contract regulated by the state, 
Monogamy was the only form of marriage sanctioned by the state. Polygamy, the court explained, has always been odious among the northern and western nations of Europe. Latter-day Saints sincerely desired to be loyal citizens of the United States, which they considered a, a divinely founded nation. But they also accepted plural marriage as a commandment from God and believed the court was unjustly depriving them of their right to follow God's commandments. Commands, excuse me. Okay, let's jump into that one. Who wants to start? Anthony wants to start. Yes, loyal citizens of the United States, um, which gets into some really interesting history. The Utah War of 1857 to 1858, um, the federal government came in uh, and they removed Brigham Young as uh, the governor and installed a non-Mormon governor and they sent, and, and there was like, well, they call it the Utah War, right, of 1857 to 1858. And, and so eventually what happened is, uh, is the federal government gave full amnesty for, of, for charges of sedition and treason uh, to the citizens of Utah by President James Buchanan on condition that they accepted U.S. federal authority. And then U.S. troops, uh, army uh, occupied Utah until uh, the Civil War time, and they left in 1861. So in any event, it's a lot more complicated than saying that the Latter-day Saints wanted to be loyal citizens of the United States because they actually were at risk of charges of sedition and treason, and uh, Brigham Young was removed as governor during that period. And I want to talk about why, because when we throw out the word sedition, like the, the Mormon narrative, at least the one I grew up with, and I, the one that I feel like this essay sort of perpetuates is that like, hey, listen, it was acceptable in other areas of the world. They went over there. They were just trying to practice it. And, you know, they fought they fought for it in the Constitution because they believed it was the right thing to do and they had the religious right. Well, what's interesting is Every time the government didn't come out hard on Mormons um, in federal Utah, they there was the gold rush happening. They knew Mormon territory was controlled by Brigham Young, and they knew that people passing through Utah territory that were Americans going to California were experiencing trouble. And Brigham Young had plans to colonize California. The Utah territory incorporated California. And he had Sam Brannan, a Mormon guy out there, and all of these people running Mormon territory. So they sent out people several times, including judges, federal judges, to get federal control. And Mormons ran them out of town all the time. They would burn them down, uh, sorry, burn down their like property, their barns, scare them away. When Johnston's army comes in through the canyon, Mormons are blowing things up. They're poisoning their wells. They're poisoning their cattle. They were the aggressors. And like Anthony said, they installed this this Mormon, um, th- this non-Mormon governor, territorial governor, and they moved the capital from Salt Lake City down to um, sort of central Utah. If to fill more Utah because they wanted to wrest it away from Brigham Young and Brigham Young, it just didn't work because they were running out all the judges. And that's why the government started to get more and more aggressive because Mormon reaction and response to this wasn't just like, hey, let us do our thing in peace. It's like, we're going to do our thing here and we're going to be in charge of it and we're going to control the territory and you can't say anything about it. And there was other violence. So the Utah War followed the Mountain Meadows Massacre and other violent acts perpetuated by members of the church. So it's glo- it's a polished narrative, I think, that the members of the church desired to be loyal citizens of the United States uh, in this essay at that point. Yeah, even, even all the way to today, to today we we kind of have this as Mormons, this odd relationship with with the United States, where this is a promised land that uh, this is Zion that was that was kept for first for Lehi and his folks, and now for the for the restoration. But then there's this tension. You just walked through a whole bunch of it. Uh, the Council of Fifty uh, introduces some more of that, and and even all the way up until the 1930s in the Temple with the Oath of Vengeance was specific. I mean, it, that was. I mean, I don't want to read things word for word. I still feel weird about that on podcasts, but reading, reading some of it saying, you know, in, in the temple up until the, the 1930s, it was said, uh, you agreed to 
pray and never cease to pray to Almighty God to avenge the blood of the prophets, Hiram and Joseph, upon this nation, and that you will teach the same to your children and to your children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Now, for those that have been through the temple, that's something that would be read and you would bow your head and say yes. Uh, That doesn't seem like a very loyal citizen of the United States to be vowing vengeance. Not just that, but like it still exists today. A lot of people don't realize, and I'm trying to get the word out on this, so hopefully this will help, that the uh, the majority of the, this like libertarian movement in the Inner Mountain West has Mormon involvement, if not Mormon leadership. In fact, a lot of the militias that are considered, you know, hate groups that the FBI is following these three percenter militias and stuff, they're Mormons and they're Mormon fundamentalists. And I know this because I've interacted and engaged with these people. They really believe that God's law is above man's law. And that's, that comes from this period of time where, okay, it's, it's almost like they're saying, you know, U S government head Pat will, will consider you, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let you protect us. We'll let you build our infrastructure. We'll let you protect our rights, but really we're the people that are running the show. And I think that that still exists today. That ties into the next paragraph just perfectly because the next paragraph kind of reads differently when you keep that modern context in mind with what you just said, Lindsay. So it says, confronted with these contradictory allegiances, church leaders encouraged members to obey God rather than man. Many Latter-day Saints embarked on a course of civil disobedience during the 1880s by continuing to live in plural marriage and to enter new plural marriages the federal government responded by enacting ever more punishing legislation. Again, there's this, there's this tension now not reading from the essay anymore. There's this tension between, you know, one of our articles of faith saying we obey the laws of, of the land, but then there are periods of, of time, arguably today as well. Like you just explained that we need to obey God before man. That's, that's the priority here. Uh, at first I have a comment in the, in the essay that says, this is a nice, this is a good admission that, the essay is is admitting that they the church leaders were encouraging members to participate in civil disobedience rather than trying to hide that fact. They just come out and say it, and I appreciate that they that they do come out and say it. Any thoughts there before I, I was we just keep wondering, going? Do the do the Bundys and the other people today do they ref- use that language? Do they refer to what they do as civil disobedience? Absolutely. The Bundys really believe that they are acting out of a higher law. In fact, when I, so I, I met the Bundy family and Ryan showed us his, like his book that they keep the nay book is what they call, call it. And it's just sort of a, a compilation of um, quotes from church leaders, including mostly John Taylor. There's a lot of John Taylor in there, but uh, all these church leaders, Kimball, Benson, these guys who are saying, you know, quotes about liberty and justice. But what was really interesting is I was flipping through this book in the in the binder corners, the pockets were a bunch of letters from LeGrand Richards, I remember saying, and I can't remember all the other ones. I was kind of flipping through it really quick, but they were letters from church leaders um, telling the Bundys up in at least till the 1970s that you are blessed to be on this land. God has ordained you for this purpose. And, and any Mormon knows that if you get a letter like that from the first presidency or an apostle or a church leader like that, that might as well be God's word. So folks like that, they absolutely believe that they are doing God's work. It is ingrained in them. There's a whole anti-tax movement in Utah. There's a whole libertarian strain, which I grew up part of. My family is very much like aligned. There's a portion of my family is very much aligned with like the Bundy libertarian faction that believes that like the government is only in power as long as it's righteous. But where we get tricky and get into some murky waters is who gets to decide that? When the you know so anytime a Democrat is in office in the United States, for example, these militias really go to town. In fact, when Obama was president, we know that the AUB they they actually um, for a time sanctioned a militia who were doing trainings in Mount Pleasant, and then the AUB had to sort of uh, distance themselves from it because they went off the rails. But they were planning this militia; they were running drills because a Democrat was in president. 
was in power and they were planning to blow up the canyon and close the roads. They actually implanted dynamite in the mountain. People don't realize this because the Democrat was in president. That fear is so deep. It should not be underestimated. And I think that anyone that is dealing with, uh, you know, sort of these right wing folks need to understand that there is a huge strain of religious fundamentalism that that comes that's really seeded by by Mormon doctrine still to this day. And, and is it fair to say that some of those similar sentiments are what existed in the late 1800s? That's what they source. They so, the, Like I said, I was surprised when I saw, I didn't, when I met the Bundys, I didn't even know what I was getting into. I didn't know much about them. You know, they were in Bunkerville, Juanita Brooks is from there. I was just interested. And when I saw John Taylor, I was like, John Taylor, that's a fundamental, like fundamentalists go with them and, and Bundys are mainstream LDS. But John Taylor is very much um, like sort of fueling that sentiment because John Taylor was deliberately acting out against the United States government. He had hiding places built into his mansions. He, uh, when he had his famous 1886 revelation, which we're going to talk about, he was in hiding um, from the federal government. Our prophets were constantly running from the government. We have this narrative of like, we're these good, like law abiding citizens. Anyone else in America saw us as an extreme religious, scary cult. And that's hard for us to contend with because we have such a different narrative. But this is why people still think Mormons are insane, because we're acting for God's ways over man's ways. And God's ways come from whoever the, our leaders at the time decide that's what God's ways are. So absolutely, it comes from that. All right. Let's move on to the next portion. Between 1850 and 1896, Utah was a territory of the U.S. government which meant that federal officials in Washington, D.C. exercised great control over local, local matters. In 1882, the U.S. Congress passed the Edmonds Act, which made unlawful cohabitation, interpreted as a man living with more than one wife, punishable by six months of imprisonment and a $300 fine. In 1887, Congress passed the Edmonds-Tucker Act to punish the church itself, not just its members. The act dissolved the corporation of the church and directed that all church property over $50,000 to be forfeited uh, to the government. Yes. Do you want me to say something about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that is true. There were a few acts. So when, so the reason why the government targeted polygamy wasn't because they hated polygamy. Of course, it was a scandal. It was this weird sex cult to them, you know, in the United States. They didn't understand it, especially in Victorian norms. But really, they were concerned about Mormon concentration of power. Mormons acting, this Council of 50, Mormons running for president, Mormons trying to, you know, defraud the government, all of these things. And polygamy became a really easy way for, uh, first, the Republican Party. The Republican Party was gaining uh, steam and they wanted a platform. And slavery was one of their platforms. They were going to fight slavery. But because the, the Mormon story was so sexy at the time, like their newspapers loved Mormon stuff. If someone would leave Mormon territory, they would come and they would be this darling of the media. And so they, they realized that there was some power here. So they linked slavery slavery and polygamy as the twin relics of barbarism. And the Republicans really use this to get a platform. At the same time, there are these laws that, um, you know, the government decides to craft to gain political, I don't know, momentum. Um, and so they just, they decide that they're going to get Mormons um, through polygamy because what they knew, which was absolutely accurate, was if a Mormon man was a polygamist, that meant he was likely going to be in power because if they were going after just any Mormon dude, they might get some like, you know, lonely, poor farmer in Parowan who doesn't have a plural wife. But at this time in Mormon history, to be a bishop and higher, you had to have plural wives. You can look it up. It's in Brigham Young sermons. He preached it often. So they knew that it was smart that by targeting polygamous men, they were, they were, they were targeting polygamous power or Mormon power, if that makes sense. So these acts were, were an attempt to control Mormon power, to control Brigham Young, to control these Mormons who were not following the law, who were, you know, benefiting from the, the American infrastructure, but not paying um, back in return, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it absolutely does. Anthony, think, anything, any context to add before we go on to the next one? Yeah, so so the way my mind works is I'm reading this, you know, we're going 
kind of back and forth and forward a little bit in time from the 1840s, you know, to 1896. And now we're talking about 1887. So it's kind of jumping back and forth a little bit. So what I would do is get out a piece of paper and kind of draw a timeline on it to get for context, to get a feel for what's going on. And so for the listener, the, the context is Brigham Young died in 1877. Uh, so about 10 years before the Edmund Tucker's Act, he apparently died of a bowel infection uh, in 1877. After about a three-year gap, John Taylor served as the president of the church from October of 1880 until July of 1887. So he was a key figure as president of the church from 1880 to 1887 while these things were going on. And uh, we'll allude to the 1886 revelation of John Taylor uh, while he was in hiding, while all this messiness was was going on. And then uh, there was about a two-year gap after John Taylor uh, passed away and when Wilford Woodruff became president in, in April of 1889, and then he served until 1898. So again, that's a lot of this messiness is happening while Wilford Woodruff is president. And then Lorenzo Snow uh, apparently they didn't do gaps anymore because in the same month that Wilford Woodruff passed away, then Lorenzo S Snow became president, but not for a super long time uh, from 1898 until October of 1901. And then after that, Joseph F. Smith became president in October of, of 1901. And he served a long time until he died of the Spanish flu in November of 1918. So these are, if you look at the timeline, these are the key players who are the presidents of the church during this period of time, and they all play very significant roles in what's happening. For Thank context. you. For the, yeah, no, that's great. The The context of, as we now get into more of the timeline of who's, who's in power as we go, all right, this government opposition strengthened the saints resolve to resist what they deemed to be unjust laws. Polygamous men went into hiding, sometimes for years at a time, moving from house to house and staying with friends and relatives. Others assumed aliases and moved to out-of-the-way places in southern Utah, Arizona, Canada, and Mexico. Many escaped prosecution. Many others, when arrested, pled guilty and submitted to fines and imprisonment. This anti-polygamy campaign created great disruption in Mormon communities. The departure of husbands, left wives, and children to tend farms and businesses. Uh, causing incomes to drop and economic recession to set in. The campaign also strained families. New plural wives had to live apart from their husbands, their confidential marriages known only to a few. Pregnant women often chose to go into hiding at times in remote locales rather than risk being subpoenaed to testify in court against their husbands. Children lived in fear that their families would be broken up or that they would be forced to testify against their parents. Some children went into hiding and lived under assumed names. Brief pause for anybody. I just want to I'll say one going. thing about that, which is I want LDS people, when they, if they feel any sympathy towards this, including the historians that wrote this, to understand that this is exactly the situation that folks like the FLDS find themselves in. They will tell an identical narrative, identical to the raid of 1953 when the government and the LDS church helped assist the Arizona uh, marshal's office come and take families away from children and in the raid that happened in Texas. And basically the, the prosecution that's happening now with the FLDS, they feel very persecuted. It does punish the women and children and they're the ones that suffer. They, they, you know, name their kids under assumed names. Uh, in the FLDS, a lot of kids have the same names as their fathers uh, as a way to sort of confuse things. And um, I want people to do that as an act of compassion for how we treat fundamentalists now, because it's the very same as it was for our ancestors. Yeah, that's super important to remember. It's, you know, it's persecution when it happens to us, but it's, it's just when it happens to, to, to others. And that's a dangerous way of thinking. Despite countless difficulties, many Latter-day Saints were convinced that the anti-polygamy campaign was useful in accomplishing God's purposes. They testified that God was humbling and purifying his covenant people as he had done in ages past. Myron Tanner, a bishop in Provo, Utah, felt that the, the hand of, op of oppression laid on the parents is doing more to convince our children of the truth of Mormonism than anything else could have done. 
incarceration for conscience sake proved edifying for many. George Q. Cannon, a counselor in the first presidency, emerged from his five months in the Utah penitentiary rejuvenated. My cell has seemed a heavenly place and I feel that angels have been there, he wrote. This kind of reminds me of, of Lindsay, I believe you've spoken about in the past how polygamy was was a glue for the early church and really helped it stay together. It was this uniting cause against the outside world that that really helped the church thrive. Is that is, is that accurate? Am I paraphrasing yeah, I properly? Mean, I I think the wording on that is interesting because it it's because it absolutely is true. I wouldn't even say it's polygamy in this sense. It's what polygamy did, the reaction to polygamy, the persecution from it. And again, you look up the 1953 raid. They have, if you go in the community today, you can talk to anyone and you can say, you know, tell me about the raid. And they will, everyone will lay out their bona fides of who they're related to. If they're related to Uncle Jessup or, you know, Jack Cook, who who was this great hero of the raid, who was taken away and signed his name. And, and one of the famous um, f- founding fathers of that community, when he was taken away, said, like, if you want blood, then take mine. And it's become this big thing. But Of course, that made them feel like they were doing God's work even more. And this absolutely happened with Mormons. But at the same time, something else was happening, a cultural phenomenon, which was as the Utah Territory was getting less dangerous for outsiders to pass through, more outside involvement was coming in and outside trends and fashion and culture came in. And polygamy was starting to be seen as archaic and kind of hickish, you know, something not cool to the younger generations. And so it really was this thing of like, we're being persecuted, we're going to protect our own, but younger generations were like, "Uh, I don't know that I want to be that anymore. Yeah. Anthony, I'm going to ask you uh, after I read this paragraph to to give some of the interesting uh, history that you have in the margins here. The church completed and dedicated two temples during the anti-polygamy campaign, a remarkable achievement. But as federal pressure intensified, many essential aspects of church government were severely curtailed and civil disobedience looked increasingly untenable as a long-term solution. Between 1885 and 1889, most apostles and stake presidents were in hiding or in prison. After federal agents began seizing church property in accordance with the Edmunds-Tucker legislation, management of the church became more difficult. All right, so now it's time to talk about the 1886 uh, John Taylor revelation. It's a uh, uh, very interesting history. You know, apologists will debate its authenticity. Uh, uh, some historians uh, will lend it credibility. Fundamentalists uh, base um, their doctrines uh, and sense of authority based on this revelation. So what was happening is in 1886, John Taylor was president of the church. He was in hiding. And and so the backstory on this 1886 revelation is in 1911, John W. Taylor, who was John Taylor's son and also had been ordained an apostle, um, John W. Taylor claimed that he had discovered his father's revelation among his father's papers after his death, 1887. Unfortunately, this was a copy written in John Taylor's hand. I I think it's in the father's hand. Photographs of the original documents do exist, but the document itself isn't in existence. Examinations of the photographs have suggested that the document is President John Taylor's handwriting. In 1912, Lauren C. Woolley, uh, a Mormon fundamentalist leader claim, published a claim that five copies of John Taylor, President John Taylor's uh, revelation had been made and entrusted to LDS church apostle George Q. Cannon and four other men who were not LDS church officials at the time with the intent of preserving it for posterity. So this is the 1886 revelation given to President John Taylor in September 27th, 1886, not too long before John Taylor passed away. Um, It says, my son, you have asked me concerning the new and everlasting covenant, how far it is binding upon my people. Thus saith the Lord, all commandments that I give must be obeyed by those calling themselves by my name 
unless they are revoked by me or by my authority? And how can I revoke an everlasting covenant? For I, the Lord, am everlasting, and my everlasting covenants cannot be abrogated nor done away with, but they stand forever. Have I not given, this is God speaking, or the Lord speaking, have I not given my word in great plainness on this subject? Yet have not great numbers of my people been negligent in the observance of my law and keeping of my commandments? And yet have I borne with them these many years? And this because of their weakness, because of the perilous times. And furthermore, it is more pleasing to me that men should use their free agency in regard to these matters. Nevertheless, I, the Lord, do not change, and my word and my covenants and my law do not. And as I have heretofore said by my servant Joseph, all those who would enter in my glory must and shall obey my law. And have I not commanded men that if they were Abraham's seed and would enter into my glory, they must do the works of Abraham? I have not revoked this law, nor will I, for it is everlasting, and those who will enter into my glory must obey the conditions thereof, even so, amen. So that is the 1886 uncanonized revelation from President well, That's not DNC 140? Uh, no, 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 uh, no. Is that in any fundamentalist scripture that we know of? I don't know I if don't... it's canonized. What it's about you? Not canonized. It's considered a, a, a big wound um, in, in Mormonism as the time that, you know, the church sort of bent to the will of public pressure. Right, because just four years later, the manifesto, the first manifesto comes, which let's uh, let's get into that. Uh, Anthony, that um, thank you for reading that whole thing. I think that's important to take the time to do it because it's it's a, a little known. It's not commonly talked about in traditional LDS conversations. <laughs> the manifesto, after two decades of seeking either to negotiate a change in the law or avoid its disastrous consequences, church leaders began to investigate alternative responses. In 1885 and 1886, they established settlements in Mexico and Canada outside the jurisdiction of U.S. law where polygamous families could live peaceably. As we've already, this is now out of the essay, as we've already discussed, wasn't legal there either. Uh, but they're not breaking U.S. law, so it's cool. Well, uh, can, I, can I say just, please. well, no, what happened was they, uh, the church sent down Mormon leaders to negotiate with Mexican leaders to basically say, listen, we are good farmers. We're bringing in a lot of revenue. They had these like thriving farms basically in border towns and in the colonies at the time. And they said, we'll continue doing that. Just sort of look the other way. And they struck a deal and that's how they were able to sort of live polygamy. Just kind of turn, they, yeah. they turned the other way. Good context. Thank you. Hoping that a moderation in their position would lead to a reduction in hostilities, church leaders advised plural husbands to live openly with only one of their wives and advocated that plural marriage not be taught publicly. In 1889, church authorities prohibited the performance of new plural marriages in Utah. Church leaders prayerfully sought guidance from the Lord and struggled to understand what they should do. Both President John Taylor and President Wilford Woodruff felt the Lord directing them to stay the course and not renounce plural marriage. This inspiration came when paths for legal redress were still open. The last of the paths closed in May 1890 when the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the Edmunds Tucker Act, allowing the confiscation of church property to proceed. President Woodruff saw that the church's temples and its ordinances were now at risk. Burdened by this threat, he prayed intensely over the matter. The Lord showed me by vision and revelation, he later said. He later said exactly what would hap what would take place if we did not stop this practice, referring to plural marriage. All the temples would go out of our hands. God has told me exactly what to do and what the result would be if we did not do it. Interesting. Okay. I, I don't think you need a revelation to know that that's what was going to happen. The writing was on the wall. I mean, it was already happening, right? It was already going to happen. Yeah. On September 25th, 1890, President Woodruff wrote in his journal that he was under the necessity of acting for the temporal salvation of the church. He stated, after praying to the Lord and feeling inspired by his spirit, I have issued a proclamation. This proclamation, now published in the Doctrine and Covenants as official declaration one, was released to the public on September 25th and became known as the Manifesto. The Manifesto was carefully worded to address the immediate conflict with the U.S. government. 
We are not, quote, we are not teaching polygamy or plural marriage, nor permitting any person to enter into its practice, President Woodruff said. Inasmuch as laws have been enacted by Congress forbidding plural marriages, which laws have been pronounced constitutional by the court of last resort, I hereby declare my intention to submit to those laws and to use my influence with the members of the church over which I preside to have them do likewise. All right, let's pause there. That was a good chunk. That was a good chunk. Now we're into the manifesto. Um, let's see. Do we want to take the time and read the whole, read the, the full text of the manifesto? No, <laughs> I think, I think Mormons are familiar with it. I think what people don't know, I mean, you can, you can read it if you want, no, but I think the history is more, more interesting than that. As Anthony pointed out, there's this, John Taylor has this revelation called the 1886 revelation, right? Basically there are, uh, according to fundamentalist lore and documentation, there are about eight hidden manifestos or sorry, revelations that John Taylor had where, uh, he basically said polygamy will never leave the earth. I mean, you got to remember John Taylor was in the room when Joseph Smith was killed. He was one of the guys who survived the Carthage jail martyrdom. This is not a small thing. It carries a lot of weight. And so when John Taylor is writing out these, these revelations, he's claiming he had what is called an eight hour meeting. That's part of it where he's met by, you know, eight hours of heavenly visitations where Joseph Smith, Jesus Christ, and all these people are telling him how are they're going to get through sort of this period, because it is no small thing. The Edmonds Tucker act uh, really did mess up Mormons. Like I cannot overstate how much it affected Mormons. So the vote was given to women. Mormon women had the first right to vote in the whole United States because Republicans and suffragists saw the sort of benefit of testing out the vote in the territories, giving it to Mormon women, thinking that Mormon women are going to liberate themselves from the chains of polygamy. So they, it was a strategic move on the effort of the suffrage movement to give Mormon women this vote. Mormon women do not vote how they wanted. And so uh, the Edmunds Tucker Act threatened and disincorporated Mormons, meaning you can't vote you don't have any rights. You don't have any protections under the law. And there are stories up, up in Idaho of entire stakes who there was another law that was going on in the territory up there that disenfranchised Mormons. And so if you were Mormon, you could not vote even in local elections. So stake presidencies would excommunicate entire stakes and not make them Mormon anymore. The Mormons would go vote and then they would all be rebaptized. And you have stories of Mormons like uh, denouncing their Mormonism in court and then going and getting rebaptized because rebaptism was a thing that they used to do all the time. So that happened. So John Taylor has has these revelations. And then when Woodruff is put in power, the two year gap is interesting because it gives fundamentalists a sort of like conspiracy theory, which is uh, when Woodruff was just a counselor in the presidency, he was he was uh, commissioned to be over the statehood initiative. So Utah had been trying to get statehood basically since the 1850s because they resented federal encroachment. They didn't like that the federal government could appoint territorial leaders and they wouldn't have a say, even though it didn't really matter because Mormon control meant that like they weren't going to listen to whoever the government appointed anyway. They knew that they um, had to get statehood to be taken seriously, to maintain any power and control. So they had been constantly fighting for statehood. So when Wood so Woodruff is put in charge with George Buchanan and of the effort of getting statehood, and he does a lot of this stuff, including starting to negotiate with the government about the manifesto. John Taylor is still alive when he is approached by church lawyers. He's in hiding um, when church lawyers come to him and they say, "Listen." Just denounce it publicly. That's all we got to do. Let's think about the strategy. We'll do this publicly and privately. And so that's what they do. They convince John Taylor to do that. Woodruff is put in charge of that. So when Woodruff puts out this manifesto, everyone is like, oh yeah, this is all part of the plan. This is what we talked about. Everyone ignored it, including, um, you know, Woodruff himself, who married someone six years later, the year that Utah got statehood. So the first manifesto is issued in 1890 and 1896, Utah finally gets statehood. Their plan worked until it didn't anymore. And that's where we get the Reed Smoot hearings because the government doesn't trust Mormons. So I hope I didn't get on too many tangents, but uh, it's important to know that, that Woodruff was considered not a prophet, not acting as a prophet when he was doing a lot of this stuff. So when he was prophet, then um, 
then the stuff that he was doing as prophet mattered. But when he was doing these efforts before, it really wasn't with the power of God. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Anthony? Yeah, so so understanding more of the history, I understand now that my understanding of the manifesto was absolutely totally wrong before. And so part of the context of everything's going on, we know that they're sending people to Mexico, they're sending people to Canada. We know that Woodruff, you know, added a wife, and we know that some of the ceilings that did happen post-manifesto did happen in the U.S. Lindsay shared in a prior episode where uh, a ceiling was per- performed in the Pacific Ocean, just, uh, you know, so that it wouldn't be considered in California or something like that. that. That was Woodruff's. It was Madam Lydia Mountford in San Francisco Bay. Yeah, yeah. So in any event, um, when you when you understand what's going on, and then you read this last paragraph of the manifesto, Woodruff carefully parses it. He says, There is nothing in my teachings to the church or to those of my associates during the time specified, which can be reasonably construed to inculcate or encourage polygamy. And when any elder of the church has used language, which appear to convey any such teaching, he has promptly been reproved. And now I publicly declare that my advice to the Latter-day Saints is to refrain from contracting any marriage forbidden by the law of the land. So it's all about this fine line of putting on the appearance that they're not going to do new merit ceilings, basically new ceilings inside the United States with apparently full intention to continue to practice it, to live in it, and to do new ceilings outside of the United States, even though they did some inside the United States. I don't know that you could say full intention. I mean, it's possible that that's true, but I, what, from what I understand, there was a conflict, a divide that was starting to grow in the quorum of the apostles. So you have John W. Taylor, who you talked about, he was an apostle at the time and Cowley, who was an apostle. They were, they were orchestrating and performing ceilings. They were giving other people permission to perform. And there's some evidence that there were men that were like, maybe we should slow it down. Right. So I don't know if, if that's necessarily true, but we know that Woodruff, like you said, got married post manifesto. And then the, the best story that that's kind of heartbreaking, but in, I, th- I want to say it's 1942. It's been a while since I've been in this history, but you have uh, Amy Brown Lyman, who is the release general release society president gets involved in a scandal because her husband, who is an apostle is busted in bed with his supposed plural wife slash mistress. Amy didn't know he was sealed to her, but apparently he had been sealed to her for 20 years. And so the the police who are Mormon show up with the help of apostles and apostles are writing in their journal, like crying. They were crying that they had to do this. They had to bust one of their own guys who was still living in polygamy with this supposed wife. And, you know, we talk about Heber J. Grant. He was the last polygamous prophet. He was up until the late 1940s. He was prophet because... Uh, he was a monogamous prophet at the time because his plural wives had passed away. So he was just a monogamous, but it isn't until the 1920s, thirties and forties that they even installed their first monogamous person, J. Reuben Clark to the quorum, because up until that point, you had to be a polygamist to have Mormon power. So that to me, that's when it's a signal to the Mormon people, like things are changing in the church, right? You, you can finally be in power and you don't have to be a polygamist. See, you know, you talk about the 1830s, 1840s as the fun part of Mormon history, but this this era is so fun. It's so fun and fun in quotations. It's so interesting. It's wild. It is. It is. Okay, so we're going back to the manifesto here. Just a few more paragraphs of this section. The members of the Quorum of the Twelve varied in their reactions to the manifesto. Franklin D. Richards was sure it was the work of the Lord. Francis M. Lyman said that he had endorsed the manifesto fully when he first heard it. Not all the Twelve accepted the document immediately. John W. Taylor said he did not yet feel quite right about it at first. John Henry Smith candidly admitted that the manifesto had disturbed his feelings very much and that he was still somewhat at sea regarding it. Within a week, however, all members of the 12 voted to sustain the manifesto. Oh, the way that that's worded makes it seem like, but by the end, they were all on board and everyone agreed that this is the way that it it, it was going to go. When everything that you just shared, uh, that's, that's not quite the case. 
again, it's kind of squirrely wording to get you to, to think that it, the history went one way when it really didn't. So there was an act, there was a, a, a government leader, and I'm trying to remember his name. He's a, he was a legislator up in Idaho, in the Idaho Territory. And he teamed up, I want to say, with like an Illinois legislator. And they came up with a, a, a law for federal territory in Idaho that the church that was basically going to disincorporate all Mormons ev- forever. Like, it didn't even matter. You didn't have to be more polygamous. All Mormons now were going to lose power. And so the church... Uh, fought it in the Supreme Court. They took it all the way to the Supreme Court and they lost. And that was kind of the death now. They're like, now we're going, because at, at first they, there's a lot of discussions between the hierarchy of, you know what, what if we just did it? Uh, we just denounced it. So, and kind of lived it secretly. It became a thing of power, but our monogamous men could still have power in the community. They wouldn't lose their property. That was kind of the the plan that the church lawyers presented to John Taylor. But what had happened after this Idaho law had been passed was all Mormons everywhere are going to be disenfranchised. This is the death knell. So they knew that they had to accept it. Now you're in, I don't know if you guys grew up with those apocryphal stories, but like, what would you do if someone held a gun to your head and asked you to deny Mormonism? That's, that was their test. That was really happening to them. They had to deny this, this thing that their prophet had been murdered for right and so the week that that they're doing this was just them getting on board with the legal you know strategy of how they were going to make this work all right the manifesto was formally presented to the church at the semi-annual general conference held in the salt lake tabernacle in october 1890 on monday october 6th orson f whitney a salt lake city bishop stood at the pulpit and read the articles of faith which included the line that latter-day saints believe in obeying honoring and sustaining the law These articles were sustained by uplifted hand. Whitney then read the manifesto, and Lorenzo Snow, president of the Quorum of the Twelve, moved that the document be accepted as authoritative and binding. The assembly was then asked to vote on this this motion. The Deseret News reported that the vote was unanimous. Most voted in favor, though some abstained from voting. I'm I'm trying to read if hands are reaching for mute buttons. <laughs> All right, I'll keep yeah, going. There, there are a few stories of people that were like, no, 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 I'm never going to do this. And and some of those people leave and join fundamentalism. And it's still considered a badge of honor that they stood up to the prophets and presidents of the church. Right. Now, in here where it says Orson F. Whitney read the Articles of Faith, do, Lindsay or, or Anthony, do you know if the point of that was to emphasize obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law? Okay, it was. And Lindsay's nodding yes. Thank you. All right, next paragraph. Rank and file Latter-day Saints accepted the manifesto with various degrees of reservation. Many were not ready for plural marriage to come to an end. General Relief Society President Zena D.H. Young, Smith, writing in her journal on the day the manifesto was presented to the church, captured the anguish of the moment. Quote, today the hearts of all were tried, but looked to God and submitted. End quote. The manifesto prompted uncertainty about the future of some relationships. Eugenia, Eugenia? I see my Spanish brain is turning on. Eugenia. Eugenia Washburn Larson, fearing the worst, reported feeling dense darkness when she imagined herself, herself and other wives and children being turned adrift by husbands. Other plural wives, however, reacted to the manifesto with great relief. Okay, that's the end of that section. Anthony, I haven't gone to you in a while. Anything, anything to add here, my friend? Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll get into it a little bit further, but um, they did, like we've mentioned, they didn't stop living in plural marriages. Although it, it seems like, and and we'll run into this, some men maybe that didn't have a good relationship with their some of their plural wives or decided to you know be free of them did abandon their children and their plural wives. So. In any event, uh, again, the manifesto didn't end living in plural marriages, and it didn't end new pl- ceilings either. Right. And I want to say something on on the lived aspect of it that I think a lot of people, especially historians, don't even talk about because they're you know trying to figure out dates and laws and who is affected in the hierarchy. But you have to understand that a lot of these these women, uh, most of the majority of polygamous men, maybe had two or three wives, and those women already struggled for protection and attention from their husbands. It was very hard already to survive on the Utah frontier by the 1890s. um, It was still hard for a lot of people, just like it is now. And so plural wives already uh, needed 
the church to stand behind them because it meant that they were under continued support and a protection of their husband for their property, for their money, and for things like this. And we do see that after the manifesto, it did give an excuse for a lot of men to sort of abandon the wives that weren't their favorite because a lot of men were sealed to women that they didn't necessarily would they wouldn't have chosen on their own. And it's still the case today with polygamy. And the, I would say that's the biggest problem in a lot of fundamentals is men neglecting their wives that, you know, are hard to deal with. And so women found themselves over and over and over being rejected institutionally, not just by their husbands, but now by their sister wives. And, you know, I have a family story that, that I found before I even knew about all this history about when this happened, uh, this plural wife, uh, is sort of turned out by all the other wives. She's not given any property, any money and anything like that. And it's really sad. It's on my ex-husband's line. His, uh, his like great aunt, she was the daughter of that family. She was shipped out to work up in Parley's Canyon with a wealthy family to support uh, her family because of what happened. And he basically raped her, got her pregnant. And she uh, went and did, you know, brothel work after that, because what was she supposed to do? Girls had no, no power. And that's sort of, those are the stories that we don't hear about with the fallout from the manifesto, because we, you know, we focus on the hierarchy, but people suffered under this, there were consequences and they were pretty big for a lot of people. Thank you for sharing that, Lindsay. Oh man, a lot of mess here, a lot of mess. After the manifesto, Latter-day Saints believe that the Lord reveals his will line upon line, here a little, there a little. Church members living in 1890 generally believed that the manifesto was the work of the Lord in Franklin, Franklin D. Richards' words, but the full implications of the manifesto were not apparent at first. Its scope had to be worked out and authorities differed on how best to proceed. We have been led to our present position by degrees, Apostle Heber J. Grant explained. Over time and through effort to receive continuing revelation, church members saw by degrees how to interpret the manifesto going forward. What does that mean? What's this by degrees all about, Anthony? I, I just think that this is this paragraph is very carefully parsed to allow for there wasn't consensus on what was going on. And there were people that it wasn't unanimous. It was right. messy. And so it just seems verily to avoid that complexity or to kind of polish it a little bit. Uh, it's interesting. They would parse it by degree, by degrees, by degrees of how to interpret it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Th that first line of, again, this is the second time they use the line upon line here, here, the little, there, little, <sighs> That, that is one of the more frustrating things for me that when it seems like an, an opportunity to say, you know what, we botched this, we got this wrong. Think of the November 2015 policy, for example, like we got this wrong. Instead of that, it's, it's just this ongoing process of how revelation works. And of course it wasn't going to go smooth. It's that's on us. It's line upon line here, there, here, little, there, little, instead of whoops, we kind of messed up. Uh, that's a larger topic than this specific instance. Uh, but that, that is something that still gives me some, some anxiety. Nancy. I will say, sorry, I hope I'm not taking, <laughs> I just, no, not at all. so what, what they mean by degrees is you have people who, uh, openly denounced polygamy and then you have apostles that are pissed off and resign from the quorum, like John W. Taylor and, uh, Cowley, I always get Matthew and Matthias Cowley mixed up in my head. One of the Cowleys, uh, they, they, one is excommunicated uh, in a court, basically. And one is steps down in solidarity because they can't support this. And you really do. You have everything in between. But uh, the reality is there was not an agreement amongst the church and there still isn't. And I think if people can understand that this is what happened, this is why we have polygamists today. It's not like they just chose to do something wicked. Like I was taught, like, you know, they're just off their rockers. They have documentation. They have the John Taylor revel revelations. They have a history of sanction and support from LDS church apostles up until the 1920s and arguably maybe even in the 1940s, at least privately, if not publicly. And this is why it's so messy. This is why the church had to issue two other manifestos, because not even the church leadership could get on board with this. So if that's what they mean by degrees, I think I think that's what it is. Thank you for the specifics. At first, many church leaders believed the manifesto merely suspended plural marriage for an indefinite time. 
having lived, taught, and suffered for plural marriage for so long, it was difficult to imagine a world without it. George Q. Cannon, a counselor in the First Presidency, likened the manifesto to the Lord's reprieve from the command to build temples in Missouri in the 1830s after the saints were repelled from the state. In a sermon given immediately after the manifesto was sustained at General Conference, Cannon quoted a passage of scripture in which the Lord excuses those who diligently seek to carry out a commandment from him only to be prevented by their enemies. Behold, it behooveth me to require that work no more at the hands of those sons of men, but to accept of their offerings. So this paragraph's interesting to me, only to be prevented by their enemies. This is almost an admission or a, it's an admission of we'd still be doing this. We would still be doing this if the government did not step in. That's scary. That's scary. It seems so. I mean, we still have polygamy, we plural marriage. We just don't live in bigamy. I have multiple friends who due to a divorce uh, and then remarriage without cancel of sealing, cancellation of sealing are eternally sealed to more than one living woman. Uh, uh, sometimes more than two living women if they aren't very good at staying married. <laughs> and so um, in any event, we still have plural marriage. We just don't practice bigamy. Uh, and I, I do think that there's a legitimate question here that if it weren't for what happened in terms of uh, the laws at the Supreme Court and the laws to make it illegal, whether we would still uh, have bigamy uh, in plural marriage in the church. And believe you me, I have talked to so many people over the course of this work, faithful Latter-day Saints, men and women, who when you talk to them about their private thoughts and feelings, even if they hate it, they believe it's doctrine and they believe it's coming for them in the next life. You can't get away from it because it's such a weird thing for people to talk about. There have not been open denouncements. Like I didn't know about the 1933 J. Reuben Clark, you know, third manifesto that went out. I never read that. No one caught me up to date on that when I was a Mormon woman struggling with this concept, right? I just knew that it was coming for me in the next life and I would have to figure it out. And if I didn't, the Lord would somehow magically change my heart. And that's I'm sorry, but like, it's still so much a part of our doctrine. We can say that it's not a thing that we do now, but it's still in our hearts. Brigham Young asked us to be polygamous in our hearts, and we all signed up for that. And the church signed up for it more than anything. It's structurally, structurally in our doctrine. Well, I, even just a few conferences ago, President Oaks started one of his talks talking about how he's had a few questions from women of I know <laughs> from women of, you know, he made it, he made a joke out of it, which was a little, little frustrating, but it was, he's received that question of, you know, my husband is, has, is sealed to two women. And are we going to be sharing my husband? And he gives the answer that you just gave Lindsay uh, in conference, just saying like, we don't worry about that. Like that's, that's for something later. We don't have to, we don't need to worry about that. Nevertheless, many practical matters had to be settled. The manifesto was silent on what existing plural families should do. On their own initiative, some couples separated or divorced as a result of the manifesto. Other husbands stopped cohabitating with all but one of their wives, but continued to provide financial and emotional support to all dependents. In closed doors, in, excuse me, in closed door meetings with local leaders, the first presidency condemned men who left their wives by using the manifesto as an excuse. Quote, I did not, could not, and would not promise that you would desert your wives and children, President Woodruff told, told the men. This you cannot do in honor. Earlier, we were talking about how that actually did occur. Yeah, and like Lindsay explained, like, what could a woman do in, you know, to financially self-support and so forth? So it seems to me like Woodruff would be saying that everybody just needed to step up and take care of their wives and continue to live in plural marriage because otherwise, how could they support themselves? What were they were going to do? And before this, if you were a Mormon woman who had an issue, so, so this is the other thing that I hope more people can start to understand about the Wild West and about Mormons. We always talk about like vigilante justice and, you know, Mormon or Western law and things like that. But what we don't realize is Throughout the Utah Territory, Mormon law and Western judicial law were the same. Probate court was Mormon court. If you had a problem, you would go to a bishop's court and they would deal with it. So if you were a Mormon woman and you were being mistreated, 
by your spouse, going to court or reporting it to the police was the same as reporting it to your bishop. So you'd go before the bishop and and we have so many records of this happening because polygamy is messy and people don't get along. And so you know, you would go and most often Mormon men would rule in favor of taking care of Mormon wives. I mean, Brigham, uh, Brigham Young Hampton is a perfect example. He had a, uh, one of his plural wives tried to claw his eyes out on the street and she takes him to court and they're in court for years and years and years. And the church is telling him, yeah, we know she's a mess for you. And we know you don't like her, but you have to take care of her. That those protections stop. And, and I'm sorry, I don't care what any polygamist says. They know that I'm speaking the truth. I don't care how equitable and how kind and, and fair you're trying to be. Most Mormon polygamists have a favorite wife, just how human behavior works. And so what we see is those wives benefit more and more and more in this period. And that's great if you're that wife, but if you're not that wife, and especially if you're not those children, I mean, Heber C. Kimball is a perfect example. His children of his wives, he he neglected his wives. He couldn't provide for his wives. Those children for generations are screwed up because they are, uh, his kids were called the Kimball gang. He had a bunch of ruffian kids that were getting drunk all the time, causing problems because they had no supervision. Kids like that suffered the most under this, under these changes, because there was nothing, there was no way for Mormons to get protection from the spouse, their spouse anymore, because the church kind of said, yeah, we hope that you're going to do it, but we're not going to enforce it anymore. And that, that is a huge problem for a lot of Mormon families. Reading on, I'll finish the next couple of paragraphs here. Believing that the covenants they made with God and their spouses had to be honored above all else, many husbands, including church leaders, continued to cohabit with their plural wives and fathered children with them well into the 20th century. Continued cohabitation exposed those couples to the threat of prosecution, just as it did before the manifesto. But these threats were markedly diminished after 1890. The manifesto marked a new relationship with the federal government and the nation. Prosecution of polygamists declined. Plural wives came out of hiding and assumed their married names. And husbands interacted more freely with their families, especially after U.S. President Benjamin Harrison granted general amnesty to Mormon polygamists in 1893. Three years later, Utah became a state with a constitution that banned polygamy. The manifesto declared President Woodruff's intention to submit to the laws of the United States. It said nothing about the laws of other nations. Ever since the opening of colonies in Mexico and Canada, church leaders had performed plural marriages in those countries. And after October 1890, plural marriages continued to be quietly performed there. As a rule, these marriages were not promoted by church leaders and were difficult to get approved. Either one or both of the spouses who entered into these unions typically had to agree to remain in Canada or Mexico. Under exceptional circumstances, a smaller number of new plural marriages were performed in the United States between 1890 and 1904, though whether the marriages were authorized to have been performed within the states is unclear. So, Lindsay, can you talk to me a little bit about, um, I was listening recently to a few of your episodes to refresh my memory on some of this stuff, and um, mask wearing and not using real names and performing these things late at night. So to, to be able to have plausible deniability that some of these things were still happening, but they were able to honestly answer because they were kind of holding their hands over their eyes when they, when some of these stake presidents and, and patriarchs were performing these ceilings. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember the name because I have so many dates and names in my head. I want to say last name was Tanner. It was some big, big wig at BYU education in the, at the turn of the century, who was a professor. He takes a bunch of students down to Mexico and he ends up having an affair with one of his students and they kind of seal him. He was like, no, it's a plural wife. Um, you, it's so messy. Like you can't, you can't, even begin to acknowledge how messy it is. And I even think that part of the reason why we don't have records is not because the church was trying to hide it. It's because no one knew how to make sense of this. I mean, there was obviously deliberate attempts to hide this stuff, but there was also this, like, it was messy. Once you start removing the authority from, you know, the president of the church and giving it to other people to perform ceilings, then it gets really messy. You have stories of, um, you know, people saying like, I was told I could perform the ceiling in St. George, Utah. And I heard it from this stake president who heard it from this guy. They still can't control that stuff. That stuff still happens today. And so, so I think the essay is actually right about this. I mean, that's a very clean way of talking about a very, very messy thing. 
Anthony, anything here? Yeah, I was just going to say, I remember, you know, growing up in Mesa, Arizona, and when I was on my mission in Barcelona, Spain, that people would confuse Mormons for still practicing polygamy. And I would say, no, we, we, those are fundamentalist polygamists. We excommunicated them. Like we stopped living polygamy in 1890 with, with the information here and the other that we're talking about. My grandmother, my mother's mother, was born in 1901. If she had traveled through Utah, you know, as a 19-year-old, she would have seen LDS mainstream Mormons still living in plural marriages, right? That's not that far detached. And I think sometimes we get defensive when people say, oh, you're the Mormons, you're all polygamists, when actually some of the people we're talking to might have a grandparent or a great-grandparent that could possibly have seen mainstream Mormons living in plural marriages. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about Juanita Brooks. Um, So researching her, she actually stood up for uh, fundamentalists in the 1953 raids, and she had a really compelling argument. Her grandfather was Dudley Levitt, who was part of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, but he also had five wives, and she grew up hiding behind their skirts in their kitchens. And she talked about this. She she was so frustrated with the Mormon attitude. By 1953, Mormons were openly condemning polygamists as backward rural hicks that, you know, were perverts or whatever. And, and Juanita said, listen, they are doing the same things our grandfathers do. And when we talk about our grandfathers, we have this sweet, like little, like glimmer in our eyes of like, oh, and grandpa ran from the government. Wasn't that sweet? But when they do it now, they're perverts. And she said, what's the difference? And I think that's absolutely true. When we talk about our ancestors in their striped pajamas, we're not being like those hardened criminals that, that, you know, were sexual predators breaking the law were like, oh, wasn't it funny when they ran from the federal government? It's really weird how we still don't apply that to modern fundamentals today. Us versus them, alive and well. The precise number of new plural marriages performed during these years, inside and outside the United States, is unknown. Sealing records kept during this period typically did not indicate whether a sealing was monogamous or plural, making an exhaustive calculation difficult. A rough sense of scale, however, can be seen in a chronological ledger of marriages and sealings kept by church scribes. Between the late 1880s and the early 1900s, during a time when temples were few and travel to them was long and arduous, Latter-day, Saints, Latter-day Saint couples who lived far away from temples were permitted to be sealed in marriage outside them. The ledger of marriages and sealings performed outside the temple, which is not comprehensive, lists 315 marriages performed between October 17. 1890, and September 8th, 1903. Of the 315 marriages recorded in the ledger, research indicates that 25, 7.9%, were plural marriages, and 290 were monogamous marriages, 92.1%. Almost all the monogamous marriages recorded were performed in Arizona or Mexico. Of the 25 plural marriages, 18 took place in Mexico, three in Arizona, two in Utah, and one each in Colorado and on a boat on the Pacific Ocean. Overall, the record shows that plural marriage was a declining practice and that church leaders were acting in good conscience to abide by the terms of the manifesto as they understood them. So summarizing what we just read, they're saying, hey, we don't know how many marriages were performed but there was a ledger of, of ceilings performed outside the temple that we can be specific on. And that's where they drive into the numbers, which are low. Um, but I don't know. It's just, it seems like reading that you think, oh, but there's only 20, 25 plural marriages performed in, in that 13 year period. That's not quite what it's saying. It's just saying, we don't know outside of that, outside of this little teeny ledger. Well, supposedly that's only 25 performed outside of temples. So why did they say that there were no plural marriages, ceilings performed in temples? Or did they just not say anything? Well, and can we just talk about how most plural marriages were never performed in temples? I mean, Joseph Smith did it under a tree with his wife dressed as a man. So uh, the temple wasn't even completed until 1877, the St. George Temple. And so we have a lot of plural marriages that were being done elsewhere in endowment in the endowment house when it was built. But before then, it like, that's just such a weird thing to say, because modern Mormons think that all marriages have to be performed in the temple, but it wasn't always that way. That started happening in 1877. But even then, Marriages only happen in the temple if you could afford to travel to the temple. Uh, so ceilings 
were functionally different. So this idea of like, yeah, they weren't performing plural ceilings in the temple, but they weren't anyway. Right. Yeah, Lindsay, you mentioned that Mike Quinn is doing research uh, on the 25 or more plural marriages that were in between. Oh, yeah. You know, no. He, so he's going up to 1925 f- finding post-manifesto marriages. And I guarantee there are a lot more than 25 marriages. They might have an official ledger in the church uh, that that kept those. But there were absolutely more than that that were being performed, which I mean, Joseph F. Smith didn't issue a 1904 second manifesto because 25 people were were going rogue. There was it, it is true that the 1890 fest, 1890 manifesto uh curbed plural marriages, but they were already on the decline. They were unpopular. There were too many people at this point. Um, and so Mormon control didn't matter as much as it used to under the frontier period. So it's just, I mean, it's married, plural marriages never stopped. They never stopped. They keep going under the same authority. They say the same vows, the same things that I said in the temple, um, because you have the serene of people that know the history fundamentalists don't argue with them about Mormon history. They're going to know it better than you are because they were taught this stuff over and over and over. So um, yeah, Mike Quinn is collecting post-manifesto marriages. If you have ancestors that you know got sealed in plural marriages after the manifesto up until 1925, he's collecting it and hopefully he'll publish his research. Okay. This last uh, paragraph before we get to the second manifesto is problematic for me. Shocking. The exact process by which these marriages were approved remains unclear. For a time, post-manifesto plural marriages required the approval of a member of the first presidency. There is no definitive evidence, however, that the decisions were made by the first presidency as a whole. uh, Let me pause there. So what are they saying there? They're saying post-manifesto plural marriages required the approval, but you didn't have to have the approval of every member of the first presidency. Is that what it's saying? So this is an interesting history in and of itself because at, uh, by the, so Joseph Smith dies, Brigham Young is trying to consolidate power. That's the whole thing. But he basically says, uh, you can't have plural marriages without my approval. So Brigham Young actually makes a business of it to get a plural ceiling. You, you like would pay money and Brigham Young brought in a lot of revenue by performing these ceilings because he was the only one that could sanction it. Like everything else under Brigham Young, he wanted control. He controlled the liquor laws. He controlled the commerce, everything. He controlled the marriages, but it got a little bit more complicated. So under John Taylor and Woodruff, they start issuing, uh, you know, different people that are sanctioned to perform these plural marriages. And the wording of this essay is really um, careful because what it means is you have folks like under Joseph F. Smith, who were he is publicly and privately sanctioning and then denouncing plural, plural marriages. So he has some apostles that he approves their plural marriage, uh, them to seal someone. And then when other apostles say, wait a minute, this person is, you know, just got plurally married. Joseph S. Smith, like, was like, what, how did that happen? And so that's what they mean. They didn't even have consensus within the quorum. And I can't stress that enough for who knows how long that lingered. Maybe it's still there's people don't agree on that in the quorum. They didn't agree on who got to do it and what counted as valid. Why why would they intentionally omit? I I don't understand why they would. Why would it matter that the decisions would need to be made by the first presidency of a whole as a whole if if one member could approve it? I understand why they put that in there. And I don't understand why wouldn't they just acknowledge a, that Woodruff is one of them that entered into a post-manifesto plural marriage? Uh, the boat was even mentioned. It just didn't say who. <laughs> no, it's interesting. It just feels like a lot of legal language to kind of mess with your head as you're reading it. I mean, this next sentence is, I'm shocked it's put in here the way that it's put in here. Lindsay, before I, I read that, say, go ahead. I think that they probably relied on the fact that most people reading these essays aren't going to know the nuances. When they hear about a boat marriage, they're not going to go, wait, was that Woodruff? Because most people don't know about that. So what they're doing is, like I said, it's this tension of like, you know, containment. If you were to dig into the facts, these essays are technically true, right? They can be backed up. I don't think the essays say anything that couldn't be argued, but the wording is carefully enough that it doesn't create more faith crisis for someone reading and saying, they're not going to say Woodruff actually, after he issued the manifesto, kept marrying people, falling in love and becoming obsessed with non-Mormon women, you know, that's too much for people to handle. Yeah. 
So this next, this next sentence is interesting. President Woodruff, for example, typically referred requests to allow new plural marriages to President Cannon for his personal consideration. Now, this is after he already issued the manifesto. So if people are requesting it to him and he's deferring to President Cannon, I mean, if, if they weren't going to be allowing new plural marriages, why is he deferring the decision? Because Woodruff is now president, Cannon and Woodruff were put over the, the Committee for Statehood. And when Woodruff becomes president, now all of a sudden, what he does has more meaning amongst the brethren, right? So my theory is that Cannon was able to have plausible deniability, not working under prophetic direction. So if they needed to deny the marriages, they could. Got it. I'm just surprised that the essay is so, I mean, it doesn't come out and say he was, he wasn't denying everything. He was letting someone else do it. I don't know. It just seems like an admission. By the late 1890s, at least some of the men who had authority to perform sealings apparently considered themselves free to either accept or reject requests at their own discretion, independent of the first presidency. Apostle Heber J. Grant, for example, reported that while visiting Mormon settlements in Mexico in 1900, he received 10 applications in a single day requesting plural marriages. He declined them all. I confess, he told a friend, that it is always gone against my grain to have any violations of documents, i.e. the manifesto of this kind. So the example that they give is, of course, the one where uh, all of the applications are, re are rejected. They didn't give the examples of any applications that were accepted. This is too long of a history to talk about here because I know we're trying to wrap up, but I would look into Brigham Young Jr.'s, uh, his involvement in Mexico and, and ceilings, and then you'll be able to find some answers to that history. That's a big name, too. The second manifesto. At first, the performance of new, new plural marriages after the manifesto was largely unknown to people outside the church. When discovered, these marriages troubled many Americans, especially after President George Q. Cannon stated in an 1899 interview with the New York Herald that new plural marriages might be performed in Canada and Mexico. Blunder. After the election of B.H. Roberts, a member of the First Council of the Seventy to the U.S. Congress, it became known that Roberts had three wives, one of whom he married after the manifesto. A petition of seven million signatures demanded that Roberts not be seated. Congress complied, and Roberts was barred from his office. That seven million, I mean, today is a lot. Seven million then, even more. There's human inflation involved here, is what I'm trying to say. The, go ahead. And that, yeah, so I would say, and that would go to what Lindsay talked about before is this certainly would have hit the national press like it would be like in the New York Times or something like that you know the question that I would have is what would have been the reaction of the members of the church when they learned that B.H. Roberts had a post manifesto marriage and that's why the person they voted for for Congress was barred from being seated yeah it, it would be an interesting thing to know I don't know if there's any historical record on the reaction of the church when this happened, the B.H. Roberts situation in Congress. Particularly if you were someone that requested a post-manifesto plural marriage and you didn't and get it. And you were it. told no, right? And then B.H. Roberts does get it, so. I think that actually that actually adds to a lot of the ire from, so a lot of people don't realize that the, the founding fathers of fundamentalism, which we call the Council of Friends, included men, including the Woolley family. John W. Woolley was... <laughs> There's this whole thing with historians and me arguing about who had their second anointings because a lot of these founding fathers, like Joseph Musser, had their second anointings, which meant that their calling election was made sure that no matter what they did, even if they were excommunicated from the church, they were their blessings were still promised. And so a lot of these founding fathers were prominent men. They were bishops, state presidents, and members of the church who felt had a bad taste in their mouth from the hypocrisy of the leaders. And I can understand that. I'm very sympathetic because they're seeing how disproportionate the response was and how depending on the mood of the day and the power of the person in charge uh, affected families, that wasn't right. It was not equitable and it wasn't fair. So I completely sympathize with the fundamentalist claims because it sucks. It wasn't done right. It wasn't done fairly. And it was really done at the whim of whoever was in charge. The exclusion of B.H. Roberts opened Mormon marital practices to renewed scrutiny. Church President Lorenzo Snow issued a statement clarifying that new plural marriages had ceased in the church and that the manifesto extended to all parts of the world. Counsel, he repeated in private. 
Even so, a small number of new plural marriages continued to be performed, probably without President Snow's knowledge or approval. After Joseph F. Smith became church president in 1901, a small number of new plural marriages were also performed during the early years of his administration. The church's role in these marriages became a subject of intense debate after Reed Smoot, an apostle, was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1903. Although Smoot was a monogamist, his apostleship put his loyalty to the country under scrutiny. How could Smoot both uphold the laws of the church, some of whose officers had performed, consented to, or participated in new plural marriages, and uphold the laws of the land, which made plural marriage illegal? For four years, legislators debated this question in lengthy public hearings. Uh, let me read one more paragraph here before we jump in. The Senate called on many to witness or witnesses to testify. Church President Joseph F. Smith took the stand in the Senate chamber in, night, in March 1904. When asked, he defended his family relationships, telling the committee that he had cohabited with his wives and fathered children with them since 19, 1890. He said it would be dishonorable of him to break the sacred covenants he had made with his wives and with God. When questioned about new plural marriages performed since 1890, President Smith carefully distinguished between actions sanctioned by the church and ratified in church councils and conferences and the actions undertaken by individual members of the church. There, quote, there never has been a plural marriage by the consent or sanction or knowledge or approval of the church since the manifesto, end quote, he testified. Well, <laughs> I, I think the, the details of just the essay above contradict that. That's what I see. In this legal setting, I'll keep going here. In this legal setting, President Smith sought to protect the church while stating the truth. His testimony conveyed a distinction church leaders had long understood. The manifesto removed the divine command for the church collectively to sustain and defend plural marriage. It had not, up to this time, prohibited individuals from continuing to practice or perform plural marriage as a matter of religious conscience. I mean, apologetics. Ah, my head spinning. Do you think that, that church leaders thought that if they amended the Utah Constitution to prohibit polygamy um, in order to get statehood, that that was all it was going to take? That's at least how they sold it to John Taylor. By this time, they kind of know it's not true. And so I honestly think that Joseph F. Smith, especially, I mean, a lot of the affidavits and stuff that we get about Joseph Smith's polygamy come from this time period because Joseph F. Smith spent his life, he spent 20 years collecting this information as an effort to convince his cousin, Joseph Smith III, that both of their fathers were polygamous. So Joseph F. Smith had a lot invested in this, but at this point, now he's brought to Congress. I really think it's kind of like a wake-up call to him where he's like, oh, this is serious. Like I'm out of my little Utah bubble now and people don't care about me here. I'm not a big man in DC like I am in Utah. And so the Reed Smoot hearings, I would recommend everyone, you can read those, you can read the transcripts online. It's wild. It's wild. The stuff they talk about women are talking about their sex lives on the podium. And uh, that's a big deal, especially, I mean, imagine your great grandma talking about, <laughs> about that in a court of law. That's what was happening. Everyone should read it. Yeah, I've read them. They're they're absolutely fascinating. I've got I've got them up here, but uh, based on time, I won't read any of the quotes. We'll save that little blossom for anyone that wants to go read by them um, by themselves. There. Okay, the time was right for a change in this understanding. A majority of Mormon marriages ha had always been monogamous, and a shift towards monogamy as the only approved form had long been underway. In 1889, a lifelong monogamist was called the Quorum of the Twelve. After 1897, every new apostle called into the Twelve, with one exception, was a monogamist at the time of his appointment. At the time of his appointment. Beginning in the 1890s, as church leaders urged members to remain in their native lands and build Zion in those places rather than immigrate to Utah as in previous years, it became important for them to abide the laws mandating monogamy. During his Senate testimony, President Smith promised publicly to clarify the church's position about plural marriage. At the April 1904 conference, general conference, President Smith issued a forceful statement known as the Second Manifesto, attaching penalties to entering into plural marriage. Quote, if any officer or member of the church shall assume to solemnize or enter into any such marriage, he will be deemed in transgression against the church and will be liable to be dealt with according to the rules and regulations thereof and excommunicated therefrom. This statement had been approved by the leading councils of the church and was unanimously sustained at the conference as authoritative and binding on the church. So shouldn't that have been official declaration one that we read in our scriptures? That was the one that said, no, 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 no. 
And it didn't stop after that, but that was the one that said, no, 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 no. So why isn't that one? I, Anthony, you and I, you shared a little, uh, little earlier and Lindsay, I don't know what your experience was growing up. I didn't know about the second manifesto for, uh, I never was talked about. It was 1890, 1890. They did not want the official date to be in the 1900s. We grew up in the nineties. We, I, I grew up in the nine. We all grew up in the 1900s rather. So it's, I don't know. This is a little frustrating. And I will say the line about like in the 1890s, they start, you know, encouraging people to stay in their homelands. That only comes as a result of statehood. So after 1896, uh, people were scared of going through Utah. There, there are, I mean, we slaughtered 120 innocent people coming through. That wasn't the only massacre that happened. That wasn't the only time the Gentiles were driven out of town. There was a reputation of it being dangerous and weird and that Mormons ruled the day. And anyone that dared come, like uh, anyone in Utah knows Emo's Grave. Have you guys heard of Emo's Grave before? It's like Utah folklore. Emo's Grave is Jacob Horowitz's grave. He He was a Jewish brewer in Utah. He dared to stand up against Mormons. And I love that his his gravestone became this like apocryphal, like ghost story because Mormons don't like outsiders. And so people knew that. And by 1896, uh, when we got statehood, we were finally accepted in the territory. We had supposedly given up uh, polygamy. And so the church goes on an active campaign, inviting outsiders for the first time in history to come into the territory, to spend their money, to open up businesses. All of a sudden it's finally safe. The gathering sort of was done because there was no need to. Now they were interested in in getting revenue into the into the town, not immigrants. Immigrants were a drain on the system. They wanted entrepreneurs and businesses, and we see a concerted effort and focus on that. And so, in 1904, what happens is polygamy still lingers. The Reed Smoot hearings interrupts their plans to become this sort of like economic boon. So what they're trying to do is actually convince outsiders yet again that that we're not polygamists. This was not really made for uh, Mormons. And that's why we don't hear about it, because we're not supposed to give up polygamy. We we never were. So this essay was one of the later essays that I read back on April 29th, 2016, or the day after, or the early morning of the next day. And... Um, so you read through the essay and it explains what happened. And I had never heard about the second manifesto and this excerpt from the second manifesto, I, I want to, I want the lead reader to listen to it and, and uh, you know, think about what it says. This is the excerpt. It says, I, Joseph F. Smith, president of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints hereby affirm and declare that no such marriages have been solemnized with the sanction consent or knowledge of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I read that, and that, I don't know how to say it any clearer, that is not true. It's absolutely not true, and it's totally debunked from what we read in the essay from the church. So my guess is the reason that we don't hear about the 1904 Manifesto is because anyone that does any searching will find out that it's a lie. That's my take. Jeez, brutal, Anthony. Gosh. Well, one only has to read the Salt Lake Tribune. They they spent decades getting off on <laughs> uncovering and exposing polygamists that were getting married after the manifesto. If they found out about it, they would publish it and publicly shame you in the Salt Lake Tribune. Yeah. All right. I'll finish this. this these section. are not, these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the second manifesto was a watershed event. For the first time, church members were put on notice that new plural marriages stood unapproved by God and the church. The second manifesto expanded the reach and scope of the first. When the, quote, when the manifesto was given, Elder Francis M. Lyman, president of the Quorum of the Twelve, explained, it simply gave notice to the saints that they need not enter plural marriage any longer, but the action taken at the conference held in Salt Lake City on the sixth day of April 1904, the second manifesto, made that manifesto prohibitory. Church leaders acted to communicate the seriousness of this declaration to leaders and members at all levels. President Lyman sent letters to each member of the Quorum of the Twelve by direction of the First Presidency, advising them that the Second Manifesto would be strictly enforced. Contrary to direction, two apostles, John W. Taylor and Matthias F. Cowley, continued to perform and encourage new marriages after the Second Manifesto. They were eventually dropped from the Quorum. Taylor was later excommunicated from the church after he insisted on his right to continue to perform plural marriages. 
Cowley was restricted from using his priesthood and later admitted that he had been, quote, wholly in error. Some couples who entered into plural marriage between 1890 and 1904 separated after the Second Manifesto, but many others quietly cohabitated into the 1930s and beyond. Church members who rejected the Second Manifesto and continued to publicly advocate plural marriage or undertake new plural marriages were summoned to church disciplinary councils. Some who were excommunicated coalesced into independent movements and are sometimes called fundamentalists. These groups are not affiliated with or supported by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Since the administration of Joseph F. Smith, church presidents have repeatedly emphasized that the church and its members are no longer authorized to enter into plural marriage and have underscored the sincerity of their words by urging local leaders to bring non-compliant members of before church disciplinary councils. Whew, there we go. So it was Matthias, Lindsay. It was Matthias. <laughs> I know. I did something with Rick Bennett, and I kept saying Matthew. I, I always get it messed up. I also get Benson and Kimball mixed up all the time. I don't know why. They look the same in my <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, commentation on, on these few paragraphs? I mean, I think it's technically true. It's really reductive for a messy, messy history. Polygamy hasn't gone away, and the church doesn't actually support uh polygamous groups, but they do interact with them all the time. And what's interesting being in the FLDS communities, you know, helping out down there, uh, there was a, they, my understanding was they didn't allow missionaries into the town of Short Creek, which is Hilldale, Utah and Colorado City, Arizona, which was a hotbed for the FLDS, the, the, basically the epicenter of FLDS. And, but then um, they eventually did. And there was a mission president down there that worked in the community, so, sort of sympathized with the plight of the people. And he was really great. He uh, he helped out in the community. And once he was released, he still continues to bring uh, resources. He helped set up a food bank in the church. And he actually uh, got ch the church involvement. And so when I first started, started to get involved, I, I saw, you know, the head of the church humanitarian department was at this polygamy fundraiser. And, um, you know, he was kind of really smug with me and he said, Oh, I'm with the church. And I, and I was, I was smug with him back. I said, what church? <laughs> I know, <laughs> which just bothered me. I was like, no, don't do that here. Um, but they were very much like, we are going to help this community, but we don't want it to be known at all. Um, and that bothered me, but now I understand because they have put it in pen to paper saying, we do not help support these communities. So they don't even want to help create, clean up this mess that they help create because they don't want to be seen as supporting fundamentalists in any way. So my question is, you know, before the age of computers, how how could they really know whether the degree to which there were post-1904 plural ceilings uh, in temples? Like, you know, if somebody was sealed to a first wife, could that person theoretically go from to Manti or Logan and end up getting sealed to another wife. Uh, I mean, I, how many times have we baptized Elvis Presley and we have computers? Like they can't keep track of that. I'm yeah. not saying it happens very often. Um, they try to bust it at the temple recommend level, but they can't, they can't do that. It's so not. Certainly there have been post 1904 plural ceilings. Yeah. According to Mike Quinn, there have, there has been. Is that a published work of Mike's? So Michael. my understanding, I mean, Mike is very methodic and slow, and so maybe it'll never get done, but he's been working on it for a few years, and we brought him down at Sunstone down to some fundamental communities so he could talk about his work down there, and he was saying he's doing an open call. He wants people to look through their family history, and if you find a record of that, let him know, because a lot of family histories will talk about it or, or will mention these things, and it's benign. Um, Anthony, to the question of if it's happening in temples, that's a less interesting question to me as who is performing the ceiling. Because when it comes down to ceilings, it's less about the place and more about the authority. Whoever has the keys, the ceiling keys, if they're performing uh, these ceilings, then it really doesn't matter where it happens because that this idea of it happening in the temple in the house of the Lord is really a modern uh, attempt of Mormons to sort of clamp down on polygamy and control how the marriages are performed. And this is why you have a lot of fundamentalists uh, creating altars and most fundamentalist marriages are done in living rooms. It's all about the chain of authority. Does that make sense? It does. I, I remember on my uh, mission, my mission president grew up in the Mexican colonies. And I remember a conversation with him about some of the polygamist fundamentalist groups there 
Uh, they would work to infiltrate the traditional LDS church, go to seminary, go on a mission, get the Melchizedek priesthood, get sealed in the temple, all along really not having disavowed their fundamentalist uh, membership. But in order to be able to participate, you know, in the corporate church, basically, um, with the idea that sometimes they might be polygamous or eventually be polygamous. Um, but what I don't know is whether in modern days, you know, in the 1990s and since, uh, if they, I think since the age of computers, it would be harder to do this. Um, but if they wanted to add a wife, they would figure out a way to get another temple recommend, you know, for a live ceiling to a second wife. So Jim Harmson's group, known as the TLC and the Mante group, uh, were, they were known for this. They, were, they had, a, they had an, a reputation for like trying to go through the Mante temple and doing ceilings. But it, it varies from group to group because, again, uh, a lot of modern fundamentalists now who broke off sort of in the 1930s, they believe the church is out of order. That is what they would say. And they call us a corporate church. And you're absolutely right that fundamentalists infiltrate Mormonism. In fact, a lot of fundy kids go to BYU and they go on missions. And um, the the story that I always tell, because I have permission to tell it, is the BBC had contacted me at one point and they said, we want to talk to a modern polygamous family who is very open. And I knew of, a, of an AUB family, Apostolic United Brethren family, who they were really trying to like destigmatize, you know, polygamy. And so I reached out to her and I said, Hey, you know, BBC hit me up. Do you want to do this thing? And she said, normally we would, but our son's at BYU and he just got engaged and she doesn't know we're plural yet. <laughs> so I was like, ah, and th this happens all the time. It's very, very common. So, uh, yeah, when, when Utahns go out of state and they hear that Mormons are polygamists, they're like, no, that's not true. I want to say probably every single Utah has known uh, a polygamist and just didn't know it for sure. You've uh, you've engaged their businesses. Fundamentalists own just as many businesses as LDS people do. And they, um, a lot of big businesses are owned by Mormon polygamists. A lot of them. I could name some standard restaurant supply, for example, uh, Washakie renewable energies. They, you know, sponsored the Utah jazz, uh, a, a lot of health food stores. Sherlin health is owned by an AUB person, you know, doTERRA uh, broke off from, not doTERRA, um, Young Living Farms. There's a lot of like fundamentalist involvement everywhere and they're just hiding in plain sight, I guess. All right, so you've reached the conclusion. Marriage between one man and one woman is God's standard for marriage unless he declares otherwise, which he did through his prophet, Joseph Smith. The manifesto marked the beginning of the return to monogamy, which is the standard of the church today. Speaking at General Conference soon after the manifesto was given, President George Q. Cannon reflected on the revelatory process that brought the manifesto about. Quote, the presidency of the church have to walk just as you walk, he said. They have to take steps just as you take steps. They have to depend upon the revelations of God as they come to them. They cannot see the end from the beginning as the Lord does. All that we can do, Cannon said, speaking of the first presidency, is to seek the mind and will of God. And when that comes to us, Though it may come in contact with every feeling that we have previously entertained, we have no option but to take the step that God points out and to trust him, end quote. The church acknowledges the contribution of scholars to the historical content presented in this article. Their work is used with permission. Even that last sentence seems to say, look, even if we really don't want to do it, we have to stop practicing polygamy. Let's go to the concluding thoughts from our two wonderful hosts, Anthony and Lindsay. Thank you so much. Anthony, any last thoughts on this topic? This has been a marathon, probably 12 hours of polygamy conversation yeah. across four episodes. It's been super fun. I'm so grateful to have been able to participate in this. And uh, this essay is super interesting. So, you know, listener, there's all sorts of, you know, thing tangents to study that are super curious and interesting with regard to these things. And so in any event, uh, thanks, Alan, for moderating. And thank you so much, my dear friend, Lindsay, for participating with us uh, in these few episodes uh, about plural marriage. Thanks, Anthony. Lindsay. I just want to say thanks for letting me talk about one of the most interesting periods of Mormon history that there is. I really like to talk about this, especially because it's still a living history. We we want to talk about something in the past, but we're, you know, 
these are our grandparents, at least my generation. This is my grandparents' generation. They grew up with this. You know, my, my grandparents were born in the early 1900s. And so you can go and meet fundamentalists who know these people who were affected. There are still people in Short Creek community that were alive for the 1953 raid, right? And so this is a very much an unfolding history. It's not done. The history of polygamy in the church is not done. Uh, if you're an LDS person and you struggle with this, I would recommend Carolyn Pearson's book, The Ghost of Eternal Polygamy. She talks specifically to the LDS experience of polygamy. She talks about the impacts that it still has on our community today. And I think it's really important. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Gospel Topics Essays, the last for polygamy. Anywhere from one to 15 months from now, we will have another episode on the next essay. <laughs> and once again, just leaps and bounds of thank yous to both Anthony and Lindsay and others. Bill Real has been on other episodes. Uh, Bill, you're listening to this because Bill edits these episodes. We hope your visit with your father was great. And that is a very valid excuse for not being here. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you on the next one.